Cool, and we're live. Hey, everybody. My name is Jamal with Creator, and I'm chilling with the amazing JR Mancroft. Say what's up, JR. What's going on? What's going on, guys? I'm kind of excited to do this. <laughs> cool, cool. So he's currently in LA. He is a photographer, an amazing photographer, does a lot of portraiture in the uh, kind of celebrity lifestyle editorial world. And I guess, JR, just give people a quick one minute background about yourself and then we'll we'll get into it cool um but i think i got into this through um where do i start i have interest in so many things and what i found was that photography allowed me to kind of combine everything um, psychology science art traveling the outdoors people uh I started photo assisting. I kind of worked my way up through that, um, living in New York and LA. And for the past eight years, I've been shooting. So I guess that's a really brief, brief summary on that. And then I guess quickly, before we get into some of the questions, just kind of talk about how you came into being a photographer? Did you study that at school? I know you assisted it un under some, some big name photographers, so we'll talk about that. But just talk about how you, you know, transitioned into becoming a photographer. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think that's a fair question. Um, I went to school for physics, and then I switched over to psychology, and then I went to fine art. Kind of couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. Found a professor I really loved in photography, kind of went in that direction. Um, didn't plan on going into this career at all, really. And then somehow Annie Leibovitz's uh, studio manager got in touch with me about an internship. Um, went to New York. That internship kind of fell through before I even had the opportunity to start it. So I was kind of left on the streets, not literally, but um, not knowing what I was going to do. And I bumped into kind of someone who became my mentor, who was working with David LaChapelle and Patrick Marchelier, and I just started going on set right off the bat with these incredible, you know, portrait and fashion photographers. Um, and at that time, all I was really interested in was absorbing. So I was just learning to light, learning about the cameras, learning all the technical stuff, traveling. Um, that built itself into a career where eventually I started, you know, working for all these incredible photographers. And at some point, uh, I decided I wanted to start shooting, so I started building a couple of portfolios. Uh, nothing seemed to click. Nothing felt like my voice. I kept on shooting what the other photographers I worked for were shooting. And uh, then one day I saw a friend of mine. I never shot like a male portrait before. I had this like idea that I was going to be, like this romantic notion that I was going to be a fashion photographer. And... I just went over to his place and took and took his portrait. I just brought over one light, kept it really simple. Um, I was so used to these like gigantic uh, sets and productions, and I just kind of let myself be and let things flow. And that instantaneously uh, felt right. And the images that I shot from that day felt unique. They felt like me. I built up this portfolio within like two months off of that experience and I took it to New York and I met with everyone that I had been networking for the past 10 years through photo assisting. So all the major magazines, art buyers, and I got really good feedback and I kind of just went cold turkey and stopped photo assisting and started chasing my dream as a photographer, which <laughs> is its own story in itself. That's kind of uh, it's kind of the start, I guess. Cool. So let's yeah. get into some audience questions here. We have a we have a bunch. Let's see what let's see if there's any questions that dovetail with kind of what you said. Okay. Yep. Preferred setup. Planning. Okay. Yeah. That's this is a good question here um, from Gabriella. She asks, "Can you explain how you landed your first major client? What did you? Uh, what happened? What the state steps did you take? And obviously, you mentioned meeting with our buyers and going to New York and building a portfolio. So I guess talk about after you did all that, what was that next? Level? Yeah, sure. Um, so what actually, it was the same process as becoming a photo assistant. Um, what 
I ended up doing was organizing kind of, you could say like an Excel sheet where I would be blindly reaching out to, I don't know, a couple hundred people and using that Excel sheet to maintain what we had talked about. Um, it had allowed me to know when I last contacted them, when I should contact them, them again. Everyone says something different. Um, so I kind of applied that as well to photography and uh, a lot of the editors that I think even at the time, now there are like applications that you can pay that will give you email addresses. But um, at the time, I think I was just going into magazines and looking at uh, the table of contents to see who was working there and calling and trying to get email addresses. And it, it, was, it was a ton of work. Um, keeping people updated, shooting, taking those meetings. I think it took three months um, to get my first job. And I think that might've been with Oprah Magazine. Um, but I wouldn't say that was my biggest break. I think if that's even part of the question. But um, what's interesting about this field is Everyone is kind of like, oh, we like your work if, if your work is good, but we're not going to hire you until you have experience in our field already. So if you're trying to become an editorial photographer, they're not going to hire you unless you already have editorial work. Or if you're trying to become a celebrity photographer, they're not going to hire you unless you already have celebrity work. So you're always caught in this strange environment of, I, I, I can do this, but I need an opportunity. And it's very rare that someone gives you that opportunity. Uh, I think one of my bigger breaks was um, when I was photo assisting for Norman Jean Roy, I received, uh, we were working, we were doing a lot of stuff with British Bazaar and I got in touch at some point, maybe six months in to the creative director there who had moved to LA and now was doing their own thing. And she kind of threw me a bone. She gave me this job where it was like, a music, uh, it was someone's album cover, 15 to like 25 different looks from fashion to lifestyle to portraiture, all in like eight hours. And I kind of, <laughs> I crushed that. Uh, I did really well on that. And because of that, she understood what I was capable of, recommended me over to um, British Bazaar. And I think within a month, I was in London shooting Judy Dench for a lifetime achievement award for like a spread that they have. Um, but that was a process of working really, 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 really hard on kind of like the production end of things, the pre-production end of things to get to that space. Cool, Let's, uh, that actually transitions quite nicely into, you said mentioned pre-production. Somebody cool. asked a question, uh, Val here says, do you have a preferred setup that you use for most of your work in terms of camera and lighting? Mm -hmm. Um, so technically speaking, I don't really feel that, uh, the camera makes the image or the lighting makes the image. Um, I spent so much time learning lighting that I've kind of learned to simplify. I feel that a lot of artists spend a lot of time kind of figuring out their craft. And oftentimes you find out that they end up simplifying like Mondrian or, um, there's a slew of artists we can talk about with that. So for me, lighting wise, uh, I like keeping things really, really simple. A lot of the things that you'll see don't even look like light has touched it. And that's kind of how I go with that. Um, I prefer really, really soft light. I think a really good example would be uh, if I was lighting somebody in this situation that I'm in right now, instead of directly applying light to my face, like, like, you know, kind of bringing it towards my face, I'd rather bounce it into the ceiling or bounce it into a wall so that it uses that wall as a space and becomes a larger box and then it'll bounce back onto me. I also find that in that situation, um, it takes the color of the room because you're lighting into the wall and my walls have kind of a, a browner tone to them than a whiteness. And so it'll bring that warmth back onto me. So my techniques with lighting come, are very simple, but they come 
over the course of many, many years of learning little tricks and studying things. A shoe with a Nikon and a Sony, I don't think it matters. I, I really think um, you can get super technical about your lenses, uh, but when it all comes down to it, it I, you know, I use a 24 to 70 and a couple primes, like an 85 and uh, 50, and it just kind of depends on uh, what I'm doing. Actually, what I find is when I'm traveling and I'm shooting travel photography, I bring one camera and one lens. I never change it. And I let that lens dictate uh, how I have to shoot for my entire trip. So. Yeah, keeping it light, keeping it simple makes a lot of sense. Follow up question here, which I think is kind of good. Cool. She said, gotta find it. Um, oh, it disappeared on me. Ah, here we go. She says, how much planning do you do for each shoot and how much happens naturally? That's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, on the first part, uh, there's a decent amount of production um, on all these shoots. It depends. Uh, if we're talking about a celebrity shoot, usually uh, we're talking anywhere from a week in advance to two weeks in advance, sometimes only to a day in advance. Uh, so it's a matter of just kind of figuring out uh, the location, uh, my assistants, um, the equipment, how I get in and out of that location, uh, conceptually what we're gonna do, is it gonna be a backdrop, um, all of these different things. Uh, there is a good amount of production. The, I guess the idea is to get as much done as you can so that when you start that working day, everything's kind of figured out. There's no, um, what ifs and you know what could possibly happen, which inevitably does happen. Um, but uh, you kind of learn to ask all the questions that might come your way um, before that point. What was the what was the second question, Jamal? Are you there? Second, the second piece was so how much? So the first piece was what is planned the second half is what's natural right so when it actually comes to the shooting process itself i like to leave that um as natural as possible uh so in general with myself in life i like to listen a lot and pay attention a lot so when my subjects walk on set i like to listen to them first and my process is to really let them lead Everyone has a different approach. So some people um, really want to talk a lot and you know have a big ego and some people are really timid and mild and I want them to feel comfortable. So I don't try to take control at that point. I let them just kind of lead. However that is, if they need to be like cared for, I'll care for them. If they want to like take control, I'll let them take control and uh, it's really a matter of reading my circumstance and understanding, and I, I really like letting it just kind of flow and trusting my instincts so that as I have a conversation with that subject or um, as I'm learning that person and trying to understand where they're coming from, and I can kind of, during the process of shooting, kind of shift them and move them towards a direction that I'm looking for uh, once things get comfortable or um, after they get started. And to me, there's kind of the thrill in shooting portraiture or fashion or whatever it is in letting things be natural, you know? Yeah, and that dovetails quite nicely from this question from Jimmy, Jim, which says, you seem to have the ability to make your subjects relax and reveal a candid side to them through your photography. Do you have any tips to achieve this? And you kind of mentioned a little bit before, but I guess go a little bit deeper into- I can go, I can dive into that. Um, so first off, uh, everyone has to find their own rhythm. I've worked for a lot of different incredible photographers and everyone's approach is completely different. And my approach is different than any photographer I've worked for, um, which I'm really grateful about. Uh, going further into that, so, at first, when I was shooting specifically portraiture, um, 
I did that. I, what I was speaking about before, I would let my subjects kind of lead and I would feel them out. And I kind of found this arc where um, I know I wanted to shoot something unique and I wanted to shoot, that's not the right word. I wanted to find something real and raw that was them. And what I found very early on is that um, emotion is is uniquely yours and so if you can capture an emotion then um you're capturing that subject um sorry my cats are crying so i put them in a room i'm gonna let them out real quick hold on sorry about that guys i can't i can't think when i have my animals crying but uh yeah you can go through uh like say Portrait portfolio too, or celebrity too. Um, so what I found was that I was looking for an arc and um, that arc was finding a way to get an emotion out of that person. So let's say we were talking about something and then I found uh, a way to evoke an emotion, whether that was, you know, getting them upset about something, confused about something, uncomfortable about something. And what would happen is they would go, oh, and they would kind of react to something I've said. And that arc would happen where they would go, huh, never thought about that. Oh, that makes me uncomfortable. And then they might laugh it off. Um, and I would shoot a lot during that time period because I was getting this wide range of emotion. And as my portraiture started to develop, I started to learn that I could curate an emotion, that I could curate empathy or curate um, frustration or honesty by kind of learning how to control that arc more, to get them more into a specific emotion and kind of let the, uh, it's still fairly organic, um, but over time, my process has just kind of developed where uh, I'm just trying to evoke an emotion. And I'm trying to simplify that emotion too. So it, it's kind of haunting in some form, I suppose. Um, I think I'm good with that. There, Jamal. So, somebody, I think they're uh, actually it's from uh, your good friend here, Alex. He asked the question Who's been your favorite celeb to shoot and why? That always can be a dangerous question. But I guess, on, in addition to that, it would be cool if you walk us through maybe some of these portraits and talk about how you attacked it as I scroll through. Yeah, cool. Um, don't scroll through yet. I'll just answer that real quick. Uh, I had an opportunity to shoot John Baldessari. Um, I, you could call him a celebrity. If you're not familiar with him, you should Google him. Um, he's one of the most important artists of our lifetime. Uh, I actually went after that portrait shoot. Um, he's my hero, and I really wanted to shoot him. And it was a process, you know, talking to talking to their studio, figuring out, I need the, a magazine to publish the work. And I had to go through this whole process, but I ended up getting to spend a couple hours with him. And, uh, it, you know, meeting your hero is one thing. I've met a lot of people I love, but he was incredible. So that kind of answers that. Um, if you want to scroll through, yeah, I'm happy to tell you about a couple of the processes. Um, I didn't, you can even start there with like Anne Hathaway. Uh, you know, I shot this, these were, these were Polaroids that I've been shooting. So at the end of, uh, I shot her for, I can't remember what magazine, but at the end, sometimes I'll pull out an old Polaroid camera. Um, actually have it right here. Um, I'll pull out an old Polaroid camera and, uh, take one or two images. And so the thing about the camera that I'm using specifically in this instance is it's really soft, it's really out of focus, and the lens that I'm using is really unique and I can't actually look through it 
So I'm kind of holding it up and guessing while I'm shooting. And in order to get the focus right, my assistant's actually using a measuring tape from the lens to her eye. So we're like sitting there, she's sitting there, we're measuring the distance to her eye and like guessing and holding up this camera. And I take maybe three or four frames and there's something really beautiful and unique about the slowness of that process. Uh, not being able to pull the trigger 20 times, um, just kind of shooting one frame every minute. Uh, it, it just evokes something different from the subjects and uh, the camera itself just kind of shifts that process. Um, we can go through, actually, if you want to go to portfolio two, as we were looking at this earlier, scroll kind of midway in, there's like three or four white sub, like images of white backgrounds right there, Twin Shadows and Amanda and those guys. This was really interesting for me because I wanted to do a study of subjects, very plain, very kind of like Abaddon. Um, I didn't, I just wanted them to stand there and have what appears is no emotion. Um, but that was actually quite hard to do. So if you look at Twin Shadows, yeah, he's looking straight at the camera. Or if you scroll further to the other two, um, Steven and Yale, um, they are looking at the camera and they are simple, but they are extremely emotional, I feel like, at the same time. And their eyes tell a lot, um, which is something I focus on. And that process was actually quite complex. Um, I had to kind of shift them and make them go through a whole range of emotions. Um, I had to make them laugh. I had to make them frustrated. Um, and then I kind of waited. Each one responded differently, but I was constantly looking for that moment where they could just sink into their own skin and be themselves. Um, if you ask someone just to stand there and do nothing, it doesn't, it, there's no emotional context to it. So I had to work really hard for that. And also these are people, you know, Yael, this was a portfolio of influencers. They're not people that are in front of the camera. So they're just your, you know, I wouldn't say average, but they're, they're just normal, normal people. And so there's a lot to work with there. And so to curate a consistent feel and look really required a lot of work. Yeah. Talk about more, or uh, I don't know, what do you think, Jamal? Everything's everything's different. I even applied so like these white ones of so, like Jenny Slate and James like and Emily Blunt. Um, that came from that experience I had, and the first one I lit with natural light, um, and the second one I lit in studio, and it was. I was trying to basically match it up. The studio one with the celebrities is a little bit punchier. Um, but I did, the same technique applied, uh, which was fun to work with people who aren't used to being in front of the camera first. So then I could then apply it later to people like Emily, who's used to it, or James, who's used to it. Uh, and so a lot of the things that I try, um, I keep on repeating and trying again and trying to perfect, you know, certain things I... I kind of fall in love with. Um, but, yeah. Oh man, I've looked at these pictures forever. I'm also like, if you look at Billy, and like Billy Bob Thornton, um, I'm really attracted to kind of a dirtier light in some of my studio portraits. Um, I had for so long been working for photographers who needed a, a cleaner light, like the one on Jane Fonda, which is a little bit more appropriate for someone like Jane Fonda, but with like Billy Bob or even with like Fred, I would kind of push the limits of how I could light the face, you know, where like the, where if they moved a little to the left or a little to the right, then the light got too extreme and fell off in a way that was not flattering. And so I would find that, um, 30 or 40% of the images I shot were bad right off the bat because, you know, they moved out of the light and that's fine because the one or two images that they happen to like just kiss into the light at the perfect moment, I can't create that any other way without knowing I'm going to throw away 40, you know, 
40% of my images right off the bat. Um, and I'm okay with that. I've been shooting a lot of hands lately. I find hand portraits really interesting. I think they're super telling about subjects. That's its own thing though. A lot of the subjects like Jessica Chastain, for example, um, I know you use that as like an intro. Uh, a lot of times I get celebrity subjects for five minutes, three minutes, um, and I'm required to I think I shot a cover and six different inside portraits of like, what was it? Like Ethan Hawke Boyhood. Yeah, when Boyhood came out um, in 30 minutes. So it was like a cover and yeah, and four different inside portraits and a group portrait in 30 minutes. And so when you're in those situations and you're really only given like three minutes of subject, it really comes down to, um, and with Jessica Chastain, I was given five minutes, maybe, um, in that situation. Uh, it really comes down to getting the lighting right, kind of just trusting that, you know, in the 50 frames, you're gonna figure it out. And as you get better and better at it, you start learning to work in that time frame faster and faster. Um, there's a nice little rush to it. Uh, it always works out, at least it has for me. Um, every job kind of always works out. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Jamal, maybe another question. Yeah, you actually just answered um, Austin Tuck's question. He asked the question, uh, how long is your avid portrait sitting? So that was perfect. So yeah, you, cool. you kind of answered that. So you said pretty much kind of two to three minutes is your max. Yeah. <laughs> um, On some of it depends. If you're doing like a cover, you get an entire day with somebody, you know. So it, it varies. It's really all over the place. But it, I would say half of celebrities I've shot are five minutes, you know. And sometimes gotcha. it's super stressful. When I shot... When I shot Frank Gehry, the super famous architect, I walked into the room and the first thing he said to me was, you know, I've been photographed by Irving Penn and Richard Avedon. I was like, okay, <laughs> got it. And he was giving me a hard time the entire three minutes I had with him, walked out, and once they saw the image published in the Wall Street Journal, I got a call from the studio and they were like, Frank would like to know if he can use this as his official portrait, which was kind of a nice, wow, that was really nice to hear after, um, he was giving you shit. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of stress in those two or three minutes for sure. Yeah. Uh, I guess this goes back to a, a kind of another question that ties on to that. They asked the question, have you ever been starstruck by one of your subjects, which you mentioned that that one person, but I guess is it ha had any been anybody else as well? Or? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm surf I, usually not, uh, but I tend to get starstruck by people who have really done something important with their lives, in, like outside of acting. Um, whether they've done something for the environment or like, you know, I shot Buzz Aldrin. He walked on the moon. Um, that's kind of unfathomable. Um, I've been really into surfing lately, and so I just shot Stephanie Gilmore, and she is. Uh, She's only been on the pro circuit for like six or seven years. And she's won the tour, I think five of those six years, including her rookie year. So as soon as I got on set with her, all I wanted to do was talk about surfing. And uh, I was super stoked in that. So yeah, from time to time, I get a little starstruck, but it's usually uh, people who've affected, who've influenced my life in some format. Yeah, That's fun. So it's not the celebrity, celebrity per se, but it could be people who've influenced you because yeah, you, you know, have an interest in what they do, the topic of, you know, surfing or et cetera. That makes sense. It's odd. If I'm walking down the street and I, and I see someone that I've just watched on Game of Thrones, like in LA, it, it's, I get a little like, ooh, that's cool. That's that person. But if I know I'm shooting that person, they're walking, into, walking on set, it, it just feels 
I, I treat them like a normal human being and it feels normal and I'm usually not that starstruck by it. Cool. So let's switch gears here as we start to wind this down a little bit. And this is a great, another question from Austin Huck, which is, and this gets into what you mentioned to me off camera is, what's your next personal project? What's exciting to you today? And you've obviously were talking to me about it. So I guess I'll go into that project you're working on. Um, so there was uh, a pipeline protest in, it went on for months actually, uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline. and. Um, it kind of hit home for me. It was a super personal, uh, a super personal thing that was going on. And I felt extremely pulled to help in some format. And I ended up going and spending two months in North Dakota at that, uh, pipeline protest, um, with the water protectors. And I didn't go to take pictures, but I was aware that my tool to help is a camera in some respects, and that if I use it accordingly, I might be able to do quite a bit of good with it. So I went there um, and I ended up turning out a full body of work. Um, I wasn't expecting to turn out such a, such a large body of work, uh, but um, I'm publishing a book and I'm gonna be having it's up for negotiation on where this is all going right now. It's all kind of exciting. Um, like a traveling gallery show, the real idea behind the work is to raise awareness um, and to kind of shift people's consciousness and the way that they're thinking about the environment, politics right now, corporations. Um, it goes into a whole slew of different topics. And so that is a personal project is something I'm working on. I've never put together a book before. There's a lot of writing involved in the book that I'm doing as well. So uh, I'm in the process of, you know, doing the second draft with my editor right now. And that's an interesting process because I finished with most photography. I shoot it, I'm done with it and I move on. Um, this I finished shooting in January and um, it's still a relevant part of my life and it's almost difficult to look at the images like every day and re-edit it and uh, understand that this book will come out in a year and I'm going to be working on it up until then. And uh, once it comes out, then we're going to shift focus and run with a few different things on it and try to raise money. And um, it's kind of exciting. Yeah, I'm super excited about this personal project. Nice, nice, indeed. Yeah, very cool. Definitely looking forward to checking out that book once it once it drops and yeah, cool. finalize it. So we're gonna switch gears again, and um, probably I'd say maybe two or three more questions. Uh, this is more business oriented, which I think is interesting. Is how did you find your agency rep? What opportunities have they opened up for you that you wouldn't have otherwise? Two part question. Also, for all the photographers out there who are looking to get repped, what would you advise that they they do? based on your personal experience, so not a particular. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, for me, when I was looking for an agent, it was an interesting experience. Uh, I had some agent friends that weren't, repping me wasn't appropriate at the time for one reason or another, um, or they just weren't looking to put in the work. It, it, that's kind of irrelevant. So while I was looking for an agent, a job came through I had people that I could ask questions to. So I was really fortunate um, that I had those relationships while I was looking for an agent. Uh, it's hard. Um, for me, I would like to be, I, I was looking for an agency that uh, had a lot of experience um, and uh, could answer questions and work with clients um, that when I got thrown into a situation where if I was working with BMW or something like that, that knew more than I did and could negotiate those situations. Uh, I think right now, if you're looking for an agent, really what you should be looking for is a partner. Um, you should be looking for someone who's excited about your work, who is willing to promote with you, work with you, um, 
trying to be your best friend in the business sense of things. Um, you know, it's really a tough industry out there right now. Uh, it's not what it used to be. It's not as romantic as it used to be where like 15 years ago, you know, the agents helped get the work and then they would throw it to the photographers. Now uh, it's really a lot about the photographers doing the work that a lot of the agencies would do. At least for me, um, I get 95% of my clients. Uh, so it's, I'm constantly emailing, networking, taking meetings, um, looking for work. And I'm speaking to my agent about those processes. She's doing the same thing, but I find that I get further when it comes from me. So my agent kind of um, works as a manager as well as like a bunch of different things. Um, and she helps me negotiate those uh, contracts when they come in. And that's super helpful. Um, there are a lot of large agencies out there. And I think with those agencies, they're, a lot of them are just looking for, how do I word this? Um, they want a photographer who's already making money because it's business. And so um, when you're looking, if you're not bringing in a lot of money, then you have to be uh, cautious about, you know, what you have to ask yourself, like, what do you want from an agent? And, uh, you know, if you're looking for a partner and if you're looking for someone to help you grow, then you might be looking for an agent that's looking for the same. So you might want to look for someone who's younger or getting started. Um, and also like where the two of you can mutually benefit at the same time. But, uh, it's good to meet with everybody. I mean, there's no reason not to reach out to your dream agent or your dream clients just to see if someone bites because... Occasionally it'll happen. This is one of those industries where, you know, a thousand doors will be shut on you and one will open. You just have to be willing to let 999 doors shut on you. <laughs> cool. Yeah, no, I think they, uh, you answered that great. So I think um, probably, oh, we'll do two more questions. So the first one is, and this is kind of a little, uh, what would is the most challenging or unexpected thing that happened on a sheet? And how did you handle this? That's kind of a fun question. That's a good question, actually. <laughs> uh, I was doing a shoot for an extremely reputable magazine. Um, and we were shooting someone who's running for uh, Congress, I think. And they were a, a New York Times number one bestseller multiple times over. Um, and Without going, without going into specific details, they were giving me an extremely hard time. And uh, this was good for their, it was good for everybody. Um, and I, they just didn't want to be photographed. And so I was supposed to have the subject for five hours, and we were supposed to do three or four different looks, and we were only going to publish one on one page. So we had a lot of options to work with. And on my first shoot, and I had already been told that I didn't want to do this, like walking in and I was, you know, kind of prepping for like, oh, great, you know, I have to deal with a difficult subject. But 15 frames in, 20 frames into my first setup, they walked off and they were like, you got it. I'm done. I don't want to deal with this. And I was looking at the editor going, I, I don't have it. Like, I understand my time. I was just getting warmed up. This, I don't have it. And then we moved into our second shot and this entire energy that was being given by the subject of, I just don't want to be here, just wasn't working. And this is the first and only time I had done this, but um, hopefully I never have to again. But in the middle of that second shoot, I asked everyone to leave set. So it was just my subject and uh, myself. And I looked at that person and I explained to them that, listen, I don't want to publish a bad picture of you. And uh, it doesn't benefit either of us, but I don't have anything to give to this magazine. And you and I have to work together. And if we don't work together, like then I'm, I'm gonna have to print. I mean, I essentially politely threatened them so that they understood what was happening right now. And that shifted the dynamic. I'm not saying the shoot was great, but um, it was going awful and uh, just kind of that reality check for that subject shifted that, allowed them to 
work with me a little bit better in the moments. The pictures that came out weren't good. They were never going to be good because of that. But um, just like being able to talk to that subject and explain them what was going on was kind of mind blowing for me. Um, and I'll, I would do it 10 times over if I'm ever in that situation. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that's actually very interesting is a lot of people think photography is glamorous and that you're just going to be on set snapping, but you may have to get a little bit aggressive on some occasions to make sure you get what you need. And that's interesting. You don't hear those kind of stories a lot, which I think it's actually very good. And I would say kind of a, a last question. I think this is actually very appropriate to kind of end the, the day here. After that last um, story is, uh, how do you constantly grow and learn your craft? Do you talk to mentors, take fun classes, just take pictures? What do you kind of do to just keep growing as a, both as an artist and a person? Um, for me personally, uh, I've been working on myself a lot over the past, uh, Eight years, ten years, um, more. I guess six years. Uh, I've been, you know, <laughs> I've been understanding who I am as an individual, how I relate to this world that I'm in, and um, understanding the mechanisms that I that that make make me who I am, for better or for worse. And through that process, I've been growing and. I guess you could say loving myself more. Um, and in that process, it has shaped and shifted the way I see the world and therefore the way I take my own images. Um, there are lulls where you go six months or a year where you don't feel like you're creating anything new, where everything feels stagnant. Um, and there are times there are no projects that you're working on that you love and it feels difficult, but then something happens like Standing Rock and it like, for me, it shifts you a little bit. And when I was there, uh, I was taking portraits of objects for the first time, which is different for me because I've never treated objects as portraiture um, before or uh, I have this project I work on in my house where everyone who comes over, I take a Polaroid of and I put them up on my wall. And um, it's one frame. There's no redos. And so that, over, I think now I have like close to 200 uh, Polaroids. And that project has taught me a different way of looking at things, especially in this digital world where we're shooting, 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 shooting to like slow down, find your shot, and take the image has shifted things. Um, also, I don't, I don't really look at fashion magazines anymore. I used to. Uh, I found that uh, I just kept on seeing other people's work in my head. So really, I like to go to art museums. I look at sculpture. I like to um, look at performance art. Um, and I find that over time, those develop and become a part of who I am and shift me in return shift my work that's it's a small section of you know how to evolve at least how i evolve yeah no i think that's exactly that's a nicole i hope that kind of answers um your questions i think it does because that's very very true and and yeah just kind of work on yourself and that will naturally help you progress as just a, an artist because that's kind of just a part of who you are so everybody definitely feel free to check out jr's work uh when's the book coming out it's do we know maybe. so not anytime soon yeah, but when it does we'll, we'll let you know about it uh, in the meantime you can check out his website and then you can also ch uh, follow him on instagram if you click on the creator link uh his bio and all that good stuff is there so you can definitely follow uh him there and then if you miss some of this video you can watch the replay here on facebook so definitely feel free to check out any of the gems that he was dropping, a lot of great information. Um, and yeah, JR, thanks so much for taking the time to sit and answer our questions. This was fantastic. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, and we hope to have you on again soon. For sure, thanks guys. All right, take it easy, JR.